Here we go. Hey, everyone. Who do we got online here? We've got Joe and Katie and Brandon. Welcome, Fireside Room. You have, we've got, uh, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six people here. So it's not, not a huge group tonight, but we are going to talk about money, Bible and money. So here, as is my typical practice, uh, I love to open it up to you guys. Uh, I forgot anything to write with, so that could be a problem. I'm just going to answer all the questions on the fly. Um, so I like to open it up. Like, what are you guys interested in thinking about when it comes to money? I prepared some stuff. I did a little bit of digging in the Bible. Where, where's the Bible talk about money? Uh, what are the themes that kind of emerge from the Bible uh, in the sort of conversation about money and the theological conversation about money in the Bible? Um, but I'm interested in what you guys want to think about when it comes to money. So what is it? What, what is on your mind? Why did you come tonight? Jacob wanted to learn how to make money. Uh, that's going to be difficult for me to help him with because I don't make very much of it. <laughs> uh, anyway, so what is it? What's on your minds? What do you guys want to talk about? What do you guys want to think about? You guys, you guys are online. You can just chime in as you feel feel led. Bible. And yeah, Daniel. I was well, many things. You got to speak up. Speak up for the online people. Uh, basically, giving uh, was something like not just really just tied, but like beyond that, like how much or like mm -hmm. who to or how do you determine that, like where to put that. Okay. Um, and also just, I mean, really, the Bible has to say on it from you know uh, greed to mm -hmm. this. Thing. Yeah, we're gonna touch on all of that. Uh, for sure. So I'll hold on for now. You guys, were you guys able to hear him a little bit? Nice. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Way to go, Owl. I was going to say, you must be using the Owl. <laughs> Joe, you got something? No, I'm good. All right. Any other questions? Tithing as it relates to greed. Other questions when it comes to money in the Bible? The only question I really had was kind of the same as Daniel, and it was more so if you were being led to like give to I guess a mission or being led to I guess also like give at the church, and it's kind of like how do you more so like divide that up or is it appropriate to give like one and not the other, or should you be spreading it out between the two? That's kind of question like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, when we get to money and ministry, money and ministry, uh, raise that question again. Right. That's a good question. Okay, let's pray and then we're going to dive right in. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for being uh, the God who, in the person of your Son, became poor so that we who are poor in him may become rich. And I praise you for that good news. We praise you for this opportunity to learn from your word tonight. I pray that you give us a desperate humility to uh, behold wondrous things in your word and that we would have be satisfied in things of eternal value. In Jesus' name, amen. Money in the Bible. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it ugly? Is it necessary? Is it a necessary evil? Or is it a resource to advance the kingdom of God? Uh, anywhere in between. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna explore that and we're gonna maybe come to an, an answer together. Here's a question just to discuss right off the bat. Are righteousness and riches at odds? Are righteousness and riches at odds? Can somebody be rich and super holy? Is that possible? Or do you have to be poor in order to be righteous? Jesus says, blessed are the poor. What about righteousness and riches? Is that an oxymoron? 
What do you think? Our righteousness and riches at odds. No. No, okay, Duncan. Uh, I'm gonna go with the polite person who raised her hand. <laughs> Well, I was going to say not, not necessarily. I don't think that you're at odds. I don't think your holiness is determined by how much money you have or don't have. It's determined by whether you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he's done. That being said, I think when you have a lot of money, it comes from a whole host of sometimes more difficulties and challenges that you might have to face. Um, mm. That might make it more difficult <laughs> to pursue mm. holiness, perhaps. Mm. But I don't think that righteousness and riches are necessarily at odds. Okay, good. Duncan? Yeah, I was just, I was gonna say um, like something similar. And like I think there's numerous instances throughout scripture where like someone's abundance is used for unrighteousness, um, or it's from unrighteousness, right? It's a cause of their downfall, but there's also numerous instances in which someone's abundance and someone's material blessings are looked upon as being uh, sourced in God, right? And they're thankful for it. And God has blessed them um, abundantly with material blessings. Mm -hmm. And um, out of that, they bless others, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would say that they're mutually exclusive righteousness and that riches them. Okay. And I remember, I think there's a, there's a pretty wide spectrum of thought on this question. Um, I remember I, read a book by a guy named Ron Sider uh, in seminary. It's a, it's a classic book. It's called Rich Christians in the, in the Age of Hunger. Uh, and it was a pretty savage book. Um, and basically his main thesis was you are living in sin if you have more than you need. And because of the reality of global starvation, essentially, is what he was going for. It was very, it was very, um, thought provoking uh, for me. And I certainly think that he's on to something. Uh, but I think, you know, there, there needs to be proper nuance. And, uh, you know, Paul seems to say at different portions of his writings that some people are gifted with, with the gift of generosity. Those who give do so with generosity. So I think there's, there's opportunities to to have money, but um, I don't, I would agree with, I think you guys provided great answers. Anybody online have any other thoughts about that? Brandon's just rocking the Jesus saves cross. It's pretty awesome. All right, here we go. Um, here's some quotes. Let's start with a uh, hometown hero, Joel Osteen. <laughs> Uh, I saw, I watched a little interview with him and Oprah, and I pulled this from that, but he says, God doesn't have any problem with you being blessed. It's where your heart is. I actually, I actually thought that was true. Way to go, Joel. Uh, <laughs> here's one from Paul David Tripp. So these are just some answers that I dug up to that question. The money the Lord provides for us is a means of making his invisible generosity visible. That was really interesting. Really interesting quote. My money theology follows the storyline of God's kingdom. It's created, fallen, and can be redeemed. John Wesley is a pretty famous one. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Jen Paul and Michelle. Uh, never met her in person, but we connected online a couple times. She's like, I'm like a hero of life from afar. Our relationship to money is a barometer of spiritual health. Money is a resource. It's neither good nor bad. That's an interesting claim. That it's inherently neutral. What resonates with you in those quotes? What kind of stood out? Is there anything that you're like, oh, I want to think more about that? as we saw some of them. What aligns with scripture from what we just saw there? Is there one you want to go back to and talk about? Bunch of talkers tonight, that's good. <laughs> sure, you go through it. 
There we go. Osteen. I know that was Duncan's favorite. Um, God. <laughs> uh, I thought this one was interesting. This was pretty interesting to me that it follows the storyline of God's kingdom. It's created, fallen, and can be redeemed. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. It's not much left over if you do that. <laughs> Spirit, a barometer of our spiritual health. You think about your relationship to money like that? Should we think of our relationship to money like that? No. I don't know. I, I think it's there's I think there's a lot in that quote. Like obviously a lot of these quotes are like are kind of like catch-all sentences for this, yeah. right? Um so take everything with a grain of salt, but I think like just kind of circling back to what I said earlier, like I can I can think of a lot of people who are who are wealthy in a material sense, but aren't in sinful excess, and they use that wealth for like the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Like just kind of an obscure example, like my hometown, there's a really wealthy uh, dental surgeon yeah. who was basically like the sole donor to our local Christian radio station, mm -hmm. and if it wasn't for his provision, well, God's provision through him, rather, they wouldn't really exist, I guess. Yeah. Um, at least that's how I understood their situation. Um, but uh, yeah, that's just one example. So I think like, like if you're to say our relationship to money is a barometer of our spiritual health, like you have, you really have to like specify, obviously, like what, like, what do you mean, like our relationship to money? Um, yeah. Yeah, and we're obviously going to dive into that more as we as we think about it. That's yeah, like are you saying like 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 quant like our quantitative relationship to money is a barometer of our spiritual health? Because if that's what it's saying, I would disagree. Right? Like just like the quantity of money we have is a barometer is a barometer of our spiritual health. I would disagree. But I don't think I don't think that's what she's saying. Right? I would say like uh, the way you view money, the way you handle your money. The way, yeah, and I was thinking like if money's your god, that's how I interpret it, like, not like the actual amount, mm -hmm. amount right? Like, it's just the power dynamic between like is money surpassing God for you, is that where all your ambitions are going to? Mm -hmm. Um, above that, and then your spiritual health would be above it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found it to be a helpful, helpful quote. I think it's true. Neutrality. Is it? In I America? like that one. <laughs> yeah, you like that one too. What do you like about that one? Well, it, I, I, I think, I think it's true. Like, it's neutral. It's like morally neutral. It's neither inherently good nor inherently bad. It's kind of, you know, going back to the previous quote. You know, it's, it's kind of how we relate to it that kind of makes it a good or bad in our life, in our lives. Yeah, I think it's, it's a resource. Has no inherent good or bad in it. Yeah, that's good. All right, let's do a little Old Testament theology of money. An Old Testament theology of money. Uh, one of the, the passages that came to mind first, it's kind of an interesting one. There isn't a whole lot of discussion about money. There's not a whole lot of money talk until the New Testament, actually. Uh, but there are some themes that would align with the conversation that come out. There's lots of talk about silver and gold. There's lots of, you know, uh, rich kings and, and things like that. So the first place that my mind thought of in this conversation about money in the Old Testament was um, Moses's instructions to the people of God in Deuteronomy about the day where they would demand a king, uh, which is really interesting. So kings and money, there, there was to be a relationship uh, between kings and money. There was a specific way kings were supposed to relate to money and their riches. 
This is what Moses instructs the people of Israel. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me, which they would eventually do in 1 Samuel chapter 8 with Saul. They said, you know, God, everything's chaos. Give us a king like all the other nations. And they pick the most impressive and handsome tall dude to rule over them. Like all the other nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers, you shall set his king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Very interesting. And I, I think in part this is really interesting because when God created humanity and he set humanity apart from the rest of his creation in Genesis 1 and 2, the first thing he said for humanity to do was to have dominion over the face of the earth, to subdue and cultivate the earth and to have dominion over it. And obviously humanity decided that wasn't good enough. They also wanted to uh, have more kingly reign and they rejected God as their king. And they said, we're actually gonna be more than you're allowing us to rule. And they rebelled against God, fell, Eventually, things, things plummet themselves into chaos, and in the book of Judges, there's this refrain that comes up over and over again. Um, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes, and that just comes up over and over again. And then there's the story of Ruth that leads to the birth of, of David. Uh, and God restores order to his people through uh, another Adam who would have dominion over the earth. And ultimately, we find that expression in, in Christ. But um, here we see that excessive, excess, actually does not allow humanity to exercise his reign over the creation in a way that honors God. And so that's interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a meta theme over the Bible. How, how is humanity to exercise his reign? And one of the things that they're not to do is to acquire excessive wealth, lest his heart turn away. So that's a, that's a seed planted in the Old Testament when it comes to humanity's relationship to money as it relates to the heart, which will grow into a tree in the New Testament. But here it's just a seed. Okay, there's also a relationship between wisdom and money. And there's a couple of verses from Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that I thought would be helpful for us. Why should a fool have money in his hand to buy wisdom when he has no sense? And I've been pondering that one a little bit. I, I think Proverbs is a book that you're supposed to sort of ponder. Uh, and one of the things that's kind of come to me as I've been pondering it uh, is sort of a, I don't know, an ALT translation, Adam's Living Translation. Uh, what good is money to you if you're a fool? I think that's kind of what I'm, I'm taking out of that. Um, you, can't, you can't buy wisdom. Wisdom isn't something you can acquire with cash. Uh, it's something that comes with gray hair. It's something that comes with handling hardship. It's something that happens through the depth and intimacy of relationship. Um, and I think this is kind of saying, what good is money when you have not wisdom? And then Ecclesiastes 5.10, this is really interesting. It's just transitioning into our next topic that we'll cover. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. 
So if we set our heart, can you see the trajectory of where we're going here? Less his heart turn away. If we set our heart loves on money, we will be left unsatisfied, which is foolish. Uh, and so that's a wisdom principle. Satisfaction in money, a related topic. One of my favorite passages in the Bible, Isaiah 55, 1 to 2. It's this invitation to everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And of course, I think this language of thirst is symbolic in some, in some sense. It's like you who are aware of needs, those who are unsatisfied in and of themselves, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, Come by and eat. That's very interesting language. Your pockets are empty. Reach in, pull out some money. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. So whatever we are being called to, we who are hungry, whatever it is that we are being called to purchase is free. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? That is a question that I think we need to ask ourselves every single day. Do you ever find yourself asking yourself that? Why do I spend my time on this nonsense that doesn't satisfy me? The endless scrolling on whatever app you find yourself on all the time, or the toil of learning statistics and sports that are never going to do you any good, or that was me talking to myself, <laughs> uh, or you know whatever it is that you wake up every day floods into your mind that's going to leave you with the same sort of chilling, opaque emptiness that you had when you woke up that day. Why? <laughs> what a helpful question. Here's the thing to do. Listen diligently to me, says the Lord, and eat what is good. And delight yourselves in rich food. And then he tells us what that is. What's this free thing? What's the thing that we actually need that satisfies us when we're hungry and thirsty? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon that. But that language of abundance is an economic term. Uh, we're invited to waters that never run dry, uh, even when our pockets may be empty monetarily. We can have a relationship with someone whose mercy and compassion never run dry and always satisfy the one who's sick him. And I don't think I put this in here, but I, I, I think Jesus alludes to this somewhere in the bread of life discourse. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, whoever seeks me, shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then I think somewhere he says something like, why do you labor for that which is not bread? I, I think he says that somewhere in the Bread of Life discourse, but I'm not sure. But he says, if you come to me, you will be satisfied. And then he says, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness in the Sermon on the Mount, you will be satisfied. Satisfaction is something that Ecclesiastes says money can never buy. And it's and Isaiah says you can be gained for free without money. 
purchased by the act of seeking the Lord while he may be found. That's a chilling reality because there's a time stamp on that. I love this verse. It's not really about money, but I, I think it's related to money. I love this prayer from David. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. So there are, I mean, this is the age old question, right? Um, why do the wicked prosper, you know, and the righteous go hungry? You know, why are there all these expository churches dwindling and dying and like Osteen's place is just bursting at the seams? Like, what is this? Uh, and David is able to come to God and say, my pockets are empty. My storehouses are empty. There's famine in the land. But you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine found. My joy in Christ is unconditional, such that my circumstances can't actually touch that. I love that. I want that. Okay, let's come up with a summary statement uh, of the Old Testament theology of money. I didn't, I wasn't comprehensive, but there, there really is at the time. Uh, there's some stuff in the law about uh, tithing and, and what have you, and you have that whole interaction with uh, Abraham and Melchizedek, and there's some stuff in, in the Levitical law, but most of it is about like gathering portions of the harvest and things like that, and there's not a ton of cash talk in the Old Testament. But what, what struck you, what, what's maybe something we can say about the Old Testament's theology of money? Summary statement. Who wants to crack at it? Yeah, Daniel. Uh, he will provide for the material needs for all our life. Okay. I don't know if I heard this right, but material needs like always end up voidless if you put that over, um, or if you do that in excess and not in the right part, you're seeking God and being like spiritually filled, and also like God will take care of your needs mm -hmm. as you submit to Him. Okay, so money in excess cannot satisfy only true, truly seeking God can satisfy. Something like that? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Other, other thoughts? Old Testament theology of money in one sentence? Pretty easy exercise, right? Come on. That one was really good. <laughs> What's that? That one was really good. <laughs> I would say another thing too. I would say like it's really broad, <laughs> but like God, um, God does um, reward righteousness and punish unrighteousness um, in a in a material sense. Hmm. Not always, not it's, it's not always a linear relationship, and it's yeah. not always it doesn't always exclusively happen, yeah, like mathematically, yeah. But God has demonstrated that He will reward righteousness and punish unrighteousness in a material sense, mm -hmm. yep, yeah. It's called the retribution principle, right? So if you obey God, your life will generally go better for you spiritually, materially familially, militarily, all these things. If you obey God, your life will go worse for you, generally. Uh, yup. Is that what I meant? <laughs> this, is why, this is why I use a manuscript. It's a, it's a dangerous thing to let me just go. Okay. Uh, anyone else wanted to say that was heretical? Here's a better statement. Should we move on here? Happy to move on? Okay. Any questions about the Old Testament's theology of money? So far? We just did a, a high-flying overview there, but 
There's way more verses in the New Testament, so we're going to be in the NT for a little while. Money in the heart. The seed has sprouted. Deuteronomy 17 seed has sprouted in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not, says Jesus, lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure, here's the basis for everything I've just said. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So your heart follows your treasure. In some ways, drives your treasure as well. They say they, they go hand in hand. Your treasure and your heart. Your heart loves and your treasure goes hand in hand. And I think what's really interesting is if you look in the Sermon on the Mount, and these passages, I treat, I think I treated them together when I preached on the Sermon on the Mount, but they're almost never treated together. That passage is almost always treated by itself. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And then this one about don't be anxious. But if you look in there, there's this stuff about the light in the eyes and things like that, which is a very confusing passage, but I, I think Jonathan treated it as like an illustration of the laying up your treasures in heaven. And that was like the best treatment I've seen of it. Uh, but what people ignore is that the don't be anxious passage begins with therefore. It's the implication of the laying up your treasures in heaven, which is really interesting. I had never really thought of that before. He says, therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather. That's like similar as laying up the gathering, cultivate. Yet they don't gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not of more value than they? Are you not more of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you of, of you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Yeah, I, I think that passage needs to be treated with the cultivate, lay up, gather treasure in heaven. Because I think what drives our anxiety about our circumstances is it's at its core, it's subjectivity to destruction. You know, why do we lock our house at because thieves may come in and destroy. And we have not internalized the indestructible nature of the inheritance that we've been given in heaven. And our hearts have not sufficiently been fixated upon you've been born again to a living hope that is imperishable and undefiled kept in heaven for you. And we worry because of the, the destructible nature of the things that our hearts are set on, the treasures we've cultivated on earth. These passages go together. 
Our hearts are in our pockets. This is pretty, this is pretty clear. Keep your life free from love of money and be content. These are heart words. Love, contentment, satisfaction words. Be content with what you have. So he's not saying it's wrong to have. He's just saying don't toil in anxiety for that which you do not have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Sort of summarized, summarized it here. Our heart loves rule our pursuits and our worries. So we're going to be, we're going to be spending our time. We're going to be pursuing the things that our hearts love. And we are going to, in a sort of corresponding way, be worried about the things that we don't have that our hearts love. Or we have and we're afraid to lose because we love them. Maybe a pause there. Anything, any reflections? an important concept. Yeah, take it. Uh, I think we'll point back to uh, any kind of way you mentioned words uh, in laying out your trip, like laying out your trip to heaven. Uh, I just talked about like the light in you is darkest. Um, oh, yeah. Where in, uh, but like, before it says, like, what if your eyes die or your body? Darkness as well. Yeah, and kind of talking more about like, uh, like what is in your heart, your body kind of will have a kind of pursuit of what is in your heart, and it's kind of like in your heart, money, what you desire is money, what you desire is sports knowledge. Which you say it yourself, but I totally get that. <laughs> but you no, know, it's just kind of like whatever's in your heart, you know, you're instinctively going to pursue it because that's what you want to fulfill. And, it's kind of the same thought of just like uh it was cool when it said that verse in there kind of directly i said that because like it's always one of those things where if i speaking for myself don't really think of i'll just kind of simply do and it kind of goes it changes on a day to day basis like mm -hmm. one day i may wake up and it's work like i have to get you know more i guess seniority at work so i'm going to be kind of acting a different way at work than maybe i should be like preaching the way with the scripture where like that's where like desire should be Maybe now I'm just trying to kind of put that aside just so I can move up the ranks. Or if it is money, maybe I'm worried about, you know, like wedding planning and seeing how I can penny push rather than, you know, kind of desire like God's image on Mary. It kind of like distorts our views a little bit. You get married? <laughs> <laughs> maybe not now. <laughs> Other thoughts, reflections? Money and salvation. Things are getting real now. Money and salvation. <laughs> really interesting I, I think i always think the sermon on the mount as it's sort of portrayed in luke and the sermon on the mount as it's portrayed in matthew it's just an interesting study um and the beatitudes are an interesting study in and of themselves as you look at the comparison between the sermon on the mount luke and the sermon on the mount matthew because matthew begins i think the first beatitude is blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. No? Sorry? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so it's, it, it corresponds with uh, Luke's. But Luke 
doesn't include the prepositional phrase in spirit. And, you know, a lot of us evangelicals and rightly interpret Matthew's statement as those who recognize their the immensity of their sin and their bankruptcy before a holy God and come to that realization and then therefore desperately hunger and thirst for the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ a justification right like that, that, that's awesome you know Jesus was a you know evangelical too you know like but then you go to Luke and you're like wait a second Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. You know, if, if this was the only verse in the Bible, what he, what this would suggest, you'd think, would be make sure your bank account is pretty low and you'll be in good shape when it comes to uh, the pearly gates, you know, something like that. Right? That's, that's sort of the way I would read that, if this was the only verse in the Bible. There'd be a whole lot of poor Christians. There'd be more poor Christians than there are, I think. This is a fun one. Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Have you ever tried that? It doesn't fit. <laughs> you can you can get out of your tub of grease. You know, lather that bad boy up. Get that hump nice and greasy. You can shave that mother down. It ain't going through. I promise. And and Jesus is saying, it's easier to squeeze that two humped behemoth through the eye of a needle than it is to get a rich man into heaven. That's what he said, right? And, of course, it's coming off of his interaction with the rich man, right? The rich man comes to him and he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus is like, you got to obey the law. And he's like, I've always done that since birth. And then Jesus says, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but I think he says, good. There's one more thing that you have to do. Go and give away everything that you, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And he hangs his head and he mopes away sad. And then Jesus looks at his disciples and he's like, don't you see? It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye and you open this for a rich man and show the kingdom of heaven. This is the response of the disciples. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it's impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. That's why I folded it to salvation. Because it does affect our, our salvation chances, Jesus is saying. The odds are better if you're poor. I don't know any other conclusion you can make to what Jesus is saying. Thoughts, thoughts about that? It's really interesting, pretty provocative stuff. In a in the city of Ottawa, where the average income is highest in, in Canada, at a church like the Met, has a four million dollar budget. I always find it like a stark thing to think about, mm -hmm. um, but it makes a lot of sense because someone that's poor realizes their need in a more like physical way. Um, and then they also see, like it's easier for them to see they need something also spiritually. Whereas when people are rich, they don't really feel like they need something. They don't want to please them. Like they feel like they have sufficiency already. Mm -hmm. um, they don't feel like they need to depend on someone else for something. And so it's easier for someone who doesn't have it to see their needs. 
We have the invitation from the Lord in Isaiah 55. Come, everyone that thirsts. Mm -hmm. And if you ain't thirsty, it's a problem. Go to the well, man. All right. Uh, <laughs> money and generosity. Hold up. I, I, I had a comment on that last bit. <laughs> hey, sorry there, brother. Sorry there. <laughs> Don't forget about us online people over here. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I told you you should come. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, now I got to try and remember what I was going to say. Uh, right. Um, yeah, I was, you know, I was also thinking about, I was thinking about the part where Jesus talks about, you know, you can't serve two masters or you'll hate one, love the other. You, know, you can't serve both God and money. Well, that sort of, I've, I'm suddenly seeing a connection between that and kind of here because the rich person well if you're poor if you don't have the money then there's only one ma master left <laughs> but if you've got the money then you've got that other master that you could choose <laughs> man it brings free will into this thing. i didn't see that coming i didn't <laughs> I didn't see it thank you joe that's helpful um money and generosity this is getting into your, your question, I think. We're going to get there. Jesus again. Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? You know what's a fascinating study? Is if you go through the Gospels, and you see how people address Jesus. If they go with something like sir or teacher or whatever, anything other than Lord, they're about to make some kind of error. <laughs> it's really interesting. Let's go through it and look at that. Uh, and he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. So it seems like there's a connection between contentment and generosity. So we thought about true contentment and that if, if money is your love, you'll never be content. But God says, you thirst, come to me, find true satisfaction and joy that's abundant even for those whose vats are full. And Jesus is saying, contentment is the very thing that drives generosity with your money. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. This is Paul, you yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's kind of an interesting textual thing. You don't actually have that statement in uh, the Gospels anywhere, but it seems like it's, a, it's almost like a summary statement of, of Jesus' teachings. It's the uh, PLT, the Paul's Living Translation. Um, having Paul, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, prophecy in proportion to our faith. If serving in our, in our if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So it seems to me like 
contribution to the needs of the saints in a monetary way is actually something God gifts people with. But there is a responsibility on the part of the gifted to do so with generosity. You know, like if I'm, if every year the interns start over again, and I sort of mope into the intern hub and sort of like put their manual in front of them and uh, just say, yeah, you guys can read over this. I'll be in my office if you need me. It's not good leadership. There's no zeal. There's no, I'm so glad you're here. I want to help you have the best experience you can have. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, follow me and you'll flourish. You know, like, there's nothing like that. If I just mope in there like, Eeyore and give them their their uh, manual and say have a nice afternoon and I think there's a parallel here to giving if you've been given much to contribute to the needs of the saints don't just mobily throw a few pennies into the book um, generosity that's the call The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. That is extremely helpful. As it's written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. I think that comes like straight out of um, Isaiah 55. will supply and multiply your seed you're sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. The ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also is overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. Yeah, I think this is so key. it's kind of saying kingdom living cannot be a penny pinching life however and I think this unfortunately does dominate so much of our thinking about giving because of the questions often come with like so what's the deal with tithing? Is that I gotta do that or what? Uh, what's the deal here, Pastor? You know, like how, how much is the entrance fee here? You know, that's not really how it works in the Bible. It's what has the Spirit led you to do in so you know in accordance with your gifts? Uh, how have how has He led you? to contribute with a cheerful generosity. You can't quantify that. Is it 10%? That sounds meager when put in those terms. Doesn't it? But if every Christian at the Met, every adult Christian at the Met gave 10%, our budget would triple. Mm -hmm. amazing because if, if your first thought when it comes to contributing to the needs of the saints is do i got to get my 10 percent i don't know how you avoid the compulsion problem i mean obedience isn't always reluctant compulsion um 
like Jesus says, um, you know, Paul says, pray without ceasing. If you strive to do, do that, that's good. You know, it's not like don't pray out of compulsion. Like, no, it's, it's good to obey commands. But there is this freedom in Christ, says Paul to give according to the cheerful bounty that you have in your heart in the gospel that you wouldn't otherwise have. Here's some stats. I was pretty shocked by this. Fewer than 25% of most congregations give. So that means most churches are composed of 75% of the church and they never give. <laughs> the average Christian gives 2.5% of their income to churches. So Daniel, coming back to your question, what more do you want to know? I think that's not my answer. What's your answer? Uh, according to give accordingly to your cheerful deal of your heart. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, and not like it's not like a sack percentage at all. I'm getting my sixteen percent in total of this yeah. ratio, like nothing like that. But um, and it's it's also I, I definitely see like, see the emphasis on that seal part, like. Mm. It's not more so this dogmatic, like mm -hmm. old numbers. And, oh, mm -hmm. I've done it. Yeah, I like, I like the generosity. Part. Yeah, yeah. Give according to the cheerful generosity of, in your heart. I think that's that's what I would summarize all of this with. And I was talking to my wife before this because, you know, she was saying, "Are you a?" Because she knew I was coming to do this. She, are, you, are you a strict 10 percenter? <laughs> I was like, uh, no, uh, I don't think so. I would say I'm, I'm a, I would say I, I think whatever generosity means, that's how you should contribute. Uh, so if you're doing nothing, that doesn't work. I don't think that works. Jonathan said, if you're doing nothing, I remember he did this. He said, if you're doing nothing, 10% is a good place to start. Um, because that will be, it will feel, you'll feel that probably if, you're, if you've done nothing up to that point. Um, but I, it sounds meager to me uh, when you study these texts. Yeah, Rachel. I have a question, but kind of like when it comes to giving 10%, like sure. we're just in cases where it's maybe not necessarily the best for somebody like their income is not allow them to give like 10%. Like would in that case just be like whatever they can give kind of thing? Yeah, I would say the cheerful generosity applies. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means, mm -hmm. whatever you can. Kind of like where um, the woman where she had like um, she didn't have a lot of money, so she had to keep all that she had. And it's, I mean, not necessarily be like a specific percentage, but it's like I guess that that would not be generous giving because it was like all that she had. Yeah, for sure. That would definitely be radical. Mm -hmm. And that's the point Jesus is making. Like, this is radical discipleship. Even though she gave it the coin, this radical discipleship. And so when you have a coin, how do you break that down to the 10%? Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to draw on that five mil as a family. Mm -hmm. Is 10% generous? I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I can't answer that. Because it's a hard issue, is what the whole Sermon on the Mount and then Paul. 
I mean, you're, you're, you read into this stuff, all this nonsense out there about how Paul is so unfamiliar with the teachings of Jesus. And then you like read all this stuff and you're like, they, it's like harmony. It's like listening to, to Beethoven's fit. It's like a symphony when it comes to Jesus and Paul, their teaching. Like, my goodness, like, this is resonating so well. In fact, it quotes Jesus and quotes Luke. That's a whole separate issue. But all these idiots out there that are like, no, Paul has no idea what Jesus is talking about. Are you talking about the, the new perspective on Paul? No, I'm talking about like kind of liberal scholarship that doesn't think Paul was familiar with the teachings of Jesus, which is why he ends up teaching things like homosexuality or whatever, because of course Jesus never touched on that. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> Actually, I had a rabbit trail. So, yeah. How how would you uh, like when we're on the, the topic of um, like you know giving a maturity generosity in your heart? So like how, how do we safeguard against um, our giving, our giving becoming just like this arbitrary, like subjective, or almost like agnostic. Like I don't feel like it, and like the spirit isn't leading me in that direction today. So I'm not going to give. The Bible is very clear in its instruction of giving to the church. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like how, how do we safeguard against? Because I, I understand, and it is scripture. It's God breathed to give us the cheerful generosity of your heart, but. But then there is also very clear instruction in in the Bible about giving and making sure you are giving a certain amount, right? So, like, how do we safeguard against like it just becomes swinging the other way? I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So from from like swinging away from like this this like rigid dogmatic kind of crotchety old like you know I'm separated on like ten percent here. Yeah, yeah. Into the church. How do we like safeguard against swinging to the other side? And becoming like mystical about our giving, right? Like I'm not really feeling spirit feeding me this month, so I don't. I don't think. I yeah, yeah. I don't think this verse allows for that kind of thing. Because to me, to obey this, it assumes an incredible amount of intentionality and introspection and decision. Right, it's it can't be a. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring a lot of cash to church and wait for God to speak to me to tell me how much to give. But like, no, no, it's a decision and it's must. You see that must give as he has decided in his heart. This is a this is an uh, exacting sort of uh, decisive obedience. And one thing you said in there, I'm not sure I, I agree with, because I don't know in the new covenant if there is an amount prescription. Well, yeah. But then like we get into issues of the covenant, right? How, like yeah. how, how far is the, how, like how far is the, does the, yeah, the right. civil ceremony of this country? You write, you better be right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that is another discussion. I think, I, yeah. Because, like, tithe means 10. Yeah, that's, right. yeah that's, that's right. So, like, there's something there, right? It's like, yeah. It, like, tithe means something. Yeah, I think it, it, that was the legal convention for the nation of Israel. Yeah. I just don't, we don't see anything like that. In the, New, in the New Testament at all, right? So, like, so, so, would you say then that if something isn't affirmed in the New Testament, then that, that doesn't extend regulative to, principle? Yeah, would you say that that doesn't extend to the New Because I'm not sure I would align with that. Well, um, I think I have a high view of I came not to abolish but fulfill, right? I would have a high view of that. So, like, yeah, I think it's really easy to get into a rabbit trail. Yep. But, like, no, it's, it's relevant because we're talking about like just one example. Like, like, how do, so I, I would say that it's wrong to have sex with animals. Sorry, I know that's a really crass example, but it's wrong to have sex with animals. And if someone asks me why, 
I would say because it's clearly dictated in the Old Testament that it's unlawful and wicked to have sex with animals. And that's not discussed in the New Testament, right? Well, I think I disagree with that because the one who practices sexual immorality will not inherit the kingdom. Right. So when he says that, isn't he appealing to Old Testament standards for sexuality, though? Yeah, but I think there's a pre fall teaching on sex as well. Um, so a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Those, that's an affirmation of, mm -hmm. of sex within the bounds of marriage between two human beings, one male and female, for life. So we have a theology of sex right. before the fall. So I think that law was, uh, you know, to protect against the pagan practices of the surrounding nations of Israel, uh, lest they become unholy, um, set, set apart. But I agree, sex is to be enjoyed within that context exclusively. Right. So I think I may have just a, a slightly different way to conclude the same thing as you. Right. And I, I do think Jesus, and Paul, uh, that would fall under Pornea. Yeah. Okay, suck down those stats. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I jump in real quick? Sure. Um, I guess it's kind of just a question slash comment just on the last um, discussion specifically to the second Corinthians passage. Yeah. Like I, I definitely think um that passage is, is really mind-blowing to read in a mm. lot of ways because I think for me I've kind of unintentionally and like without even knowing it been thinking in a numbers kind of way like okay mm. I give my 10% of set kind of thing like that's what I have to do. Yeah. Um and not that I wouldn't give beyond that but like I think this like level of intentionality is like really eye-opening and like actually being intentional about like being a cheerful giver and what that means and what that looks like. Um, but then I, I also feel like it's really radical to hear to hear this because I've grown up just with this idea of the 10%, like just surrounded by it. Like that's just what my I grew up in a Christian home, like that's what my parents have done, that's what they raised me to believe. And I'm just kind of like, okay, where does our like modern idea of the tide of the 10% come from? Yeah, I think it's assuming the Old Testament law applies to Christians. Which, and I, I agree with Jonathan, actually. Like, I think it's a good, it's a good place to start. You're not doing anything. And, yeah, I think it's about feeling, I mean, I think there's two sides of the coin. There's this positive as aspect of, like, yes, I know in my heart that because of this, uh, because of the Hebrews thing, I'm okay. And I have open hands and I, I believe in the ministry and I'm overjoyed by what God is accomplishing here and what he could accomplish. So, there you go. There's that. But I think on the other side of the coin, there's this helps me not become an idolater to my prosperity. It's way deeper than the number. So much deeper. Because I think the 10% might help you do the former, but I don't think it does a very good job protecting you against the latter. I, I think you can still be an idolater to that 90% real easy. And so I think that deep, godly, cheerful generosity is the, is the standard. If that means 10% in your heart, if, if that 10% is coming from that, praise God. Thank you. You know, uh, so that's kind of what I would say to that. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're doing. This. 
shake us out of our Christian malaise and start obeying the Bible, believing it. Uh, what role should giving play in the life of a believer? I mean, we've kind of been talking about that. Um, anyone want to take a shot of that? Is there like a summary statement we could maybe say? What should giving play in the life of a believer? Yeah, it is. I think um, just like how we should always be living our life in worship mm -hmm. to God, all the things that we do, like our actions, giving is one way to worship God. Mm -hmm. saying, Here, this is not mine, it's yours. Mm -hmm. um, that's an act of worship. And also at the same time, even just acknowledging in the first place what I have is not mine. <coughs> even any of it is a part of that. God isn't compelling me to give in this moment, it's still not really mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're going to appeal to that verse in 1 Corinthians 4 yes. as well. That's helpful. So, worship driven, driven giving. Mm -hmm. That's a book. Worship driven giving, <laughs> right? Crossways is going to be all over that one. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I don't have time to write it, so it could be Andrew. Yeah. I don't think Andrew is. Andrew might have less time than me. All right, there we go. Money in the New Testament, money and faithfulness. This is a sort of interesting connection. I mean, we, these all overlap, but I just tried to pull out themes that money attaches itself to, and vice versa in the New Testament. Luke again, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who's dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's another super, super radical Lukeism right there from Jesus. Um, and I don't have a whole lot to comment on it other than like just ponder, you know, like whose slave am I? Whose marching orders do I march to, right? You know, whose dinner bell am I more eager to run to? You know, these kinds of things. Is it the Benjamins or is it Jesus Christ? You know? Good question. Money and eternity. Read Luke 16, 19 through 31. Let's do a little individual Bible study here. And we'll come back together and we'll chat about what we've learned. This is a fun, this is a fun text. Famous one. So if you're at home, get out your Bible there, Candy. Stick your nose in the book. All over it.
give you a few minutes to ponder your main takeaways and share them together in a moment here. All right, there's some main takeaways here. Two men, two destinies, one Jacob, yes. <laughs> um, well, I think the main thing I guess that's like all that. It's like, uh, kind of the idea that you normally hear like a lot of Christians say, and it's kind of like, like the like uh, treasure like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, here, like you can't bring your money, you can't bring your materials to have it, like so, <laughs> or you can't bring them where you're going like, to sell the gold, but stock and then gold cheap less idols now because you're not bring them. But then at the very end is what actually caught my eye more so when he starts talking about um, you know, like send them that sign from from heaven, like if, if a dead man came back and told them that they believe, like I guarantee you, he said, well, they're not going to believe the most is telling them this thing, then they're not going to believe. I, that was the main one that started the issue. Yeah. They're not going to repent with the Bible in their hand. They're not going to repent if we send you back from the dead. But why does Luke, I mean, why does Luke want us to know that he's rich? You know? Yeah. I think it has something to do with the hard spoken. Um maybe it's wrong. But um the heart spoken of the rich person is so intensely honest with this idol, this thing that that's what they're supposed to be Like, I don't know. And then it connects with what Jacob was saying at the end, like no amount of sign or wonder will change what they're gonna focus on only by a miracle of God's revealing and only personal repentance that that change. Yeah, yeah. I think people like Ron Sider might say like yeah, riches and righteousness are at odds. You know, that's what this is teaching. Uh I don't think that's what this is teaching. I think it's I think it's something more like what you're saying. And I, I tend to think that the, the heart idol is self with this guy. Mm -hmm. Like the riches are just a product of the self idol almost. Because he's still all about himself in torment. Right? Mm -hmm. Me, me, me. 
My tongue is in anguish. Dip your finger in the water. And what does what what it say? Trying to summarize it. I'm being an idiot. Uh, I'm in anguish in this flame. Have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. His instinct is to send that slave that was eating, you know, crumbs off my table to dip the end of his finger in water for my tongue. Right? Me, me, me. And it, I, it's not in the text, but I tend to think Abe sticks his arm out like this. <laughs> you know, he like keeps Lazarus from going. Because his heart is all about, I came not to be served, but to serve. I think. That's why he's like, there's a chasm here. You can't get there, even if you try. He wants to. His heart is full of mercy for this guy. I think. Natalie's smile, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Thank you, word for it. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think too, there's like a small takeaway, maybe not the main message, yeah. but um, I think there's a little bit of talk in here for the responsibility of, of those who love God to take care of the poor. Mm, yeah. Um, and yeah. I probably had a question time in the beginning. Um, that, but oh, we did, yes. <laughs> um, I don't know if this will fit in here, maybe we'll talk about it later. But I've even just with those stats that you presented, that you know, if the church gave more, like would come much more budget, the church would have to do things uh, for God's kingdom. Uh, maybe this is my lack of you know, studying this more, but um, I'm wondering if, if it's like fully the church's responsibility and only the church's responsibility mm. to care for the poor. Because um, mm. there's so many other ways, like um, not that others can't care for the poor too, but like, is the problem of poverty because the church is lacking or teaching for the poor Christians are not as generous as they could be? Or is that just, like I know part of it too is just like the fall of nature, but I wonder if, I don't know. I, I wonder if, it, if we're lacking, like, do we need to do more as a church in our generosity? Um, and if that could actually be a not just like, yeah, I guess kind of a lot of different things. Yeah. Thoughts on that? <laughs> this is a theology round table, so <laughs> I can deflect. <laughs> <laughs> This isn't an ask anything of YA, okay? So. <laughs> Thoughts on that? It's a good question. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I think one thing I would say is that um, I, I think it's it would be wrong to judge like the the obedience of Christians or like the, the efficacy of the Christian church um, using the metric of does poverty exist right now, right? Not that doesn't make sense, but like I think that like there is a tendency to towards that. So I think like all the poor people in church sucks, right? But like poverty is a reality of the fallen world, right? Like, like material absence is a reality of the fallen world. Um, however, like like to your point, I think. I would, I would definitely say that God's command through a scripture would like, like it seems to be commanding Christians and the church to care for the poor, right? Like, I mean, we could get into a whole political discussion about like taxation and use of socialized programs and stuff like that. But like, and when Bible verses are used for that, but God is instructing the church in the Bible, right? He's instructing Christians, right? He's instructing Bible believing Christians to care for the poor. And that's what our responsibility is uh, according to those verses. So, so, yes, I would say the responsibility of, of Christians and the church is to care for the poor. And I think far too much of that responsibility is placed on government. But that's all I have. <laughs>
Um, and and also we can't judge the effectiveness of the church just based on whether or not poverty exists. That's what I would say. Yeah, I I think the church's job is laid out in Matthew 28. Make disciples. Um, so conversionism would kind of be where I would land. Like go share the gospel with people. Love them, shepherd them, disciple them, teach them. Um, however, teach them to obey all that I've created. And Jesus says, like, as you've done to the least of these, so you've done unto me. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't know. I, I was compelled by Cider's thing. I, I honestly was. Like, if you live beyond what you need, that's simple. Because we are aware of the problem of Asian in the world. Uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty compelling. It needs to be nuanced. But um, yeah, I don't have a ton of I don't have a ton of things to say about that. I'm also thinking like that poverty is like the it's like a problem, but then the true problem is that you know and and it hasn't been cleared up. And so I mean the force is going to be rich. Seriously rich in, in every way. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean inequality is a huge problem in the world, right? Um, of all kinds, really. And um, the, the way the world is trying to handle that is obviously not <laughs> correct. Uh, and so I do think we need to be a beacon of light in those conversations and be the people that are like, the world's like, oh, like that's how you do that, you know? Um, and I don't know if we're there yet or if we're, if we're doing that. But there are like a couple of things in my heart that compete because I think a lot of the church goes around and hands people water bottles on the way to hell. And then there's probably another extreme side of it that's basically like preaching repentance as they're when they're too hungry to listen. You know? uh, so I think both of those are definitely wrong. You know, dig a well and jump in. You know, it's like it doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't help anybody. Uh, and evangelism without shepherding care Any, you know, yeah. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's relevant when you said about like God leading you to a certain level of generosity. And because in the New Testament, you see this kind of back to your question. Um, because sometimes you see Paul and he's like, okay, um, you guys should take a reflection to the churches, right? So like pull the money together and if they're in need of anything specific, then it's there, right? And then other times you get to say, well, if you see like an individual brother and you just say, well, God bless and be warm and fed and don't do anything. Mm. How can the love of God be in you, right? So mm. I think it's whatever God calls you to. Maybe it would be time in church more, or maybe you might not get the beach at all, but to go on the streets and get to those specific people. Mm. Yeah, I should have put I should have pulled it up. Maybe one of you guys can find it. But there is somewhere where Jesus basically says, if anyone asks you for anything, give it to them. I, I don't know where that is, but I'm pretty sure he says that somewhere. <laughs> I've always thought about that because you know, why Hazel come to me and they'd be like, man, 
this person came to me and there's this whole situation and they, they have asked me for this. What do I do? <laughs> I can't help but think of that quote from Jesus. I'm like, okay, I know this is a complex thing. And I know you got to consider this and this and this. And, it, you know, you don't want to give them too much of your personal information or whatever. But yeah, 538 to 40. Yeah, well, what does he say? Um, you've heard it said. Actually, I'm not about it. So you've heard it said, I cry six of two, so I say for you, do not represent some of the evil. If it's like a red sheet or the other, and if anyone would, would see you take your tunic, give them your cloak as well. If anyone would force you to go a mile, go two miles. Give them what he begs, do not refuse the one who borrowed from Do not refuse the one who would borrow from I'm not sure that's the one I'm thinking of. But I think you can give, there's one in Luke, like the six. Yeah, Luke six thirty. Give to everyone yeah. who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. Yeah, that's amazing. Luke's always more savage when it comes to the economic. <laughs> like it's like he just like turns up the heat. Uh, yeah, it's like anybody who asks anything from you, give it to them. It's like what? So that's an answer, and that's obedience to Jesus, right? Yeah. And how many times have I walked past a homeless person? I have no idea. And pass them, you know, like more than once today. I think there's only once today, but it's been a lot. Yep, thanks, everyone. Money and pride. Uh oh. You hate to see that. Okay, here we go. Uh, I have applied all these things to myself, says Paul, and Apollos for your benefit. So Paul opens up 1 Corinthians, and he's basically like, what's going on with all this division in the church? You got this family who heard Paul preach, and they're, they're judging the people who were um, converted by Peter, because Peter's not quite as eloquent as Paul. No, no, no. Paulus is the eloquent one. But, uh, you know, the risen Christ appeared to Paul in the vision, and that's who I heard the gospel from. And, you know, Apollos, he knows his Hebrew really, really well. And uh, we're, we follow him, and Peter was one of Jesus' original followers, and, you know, we're the Peter church. And, like, that's what was going on in First uh, Corinthians. So there's all this stuff about boasting that comes up in the first chapter. And so now we're in chapter 4. And he says, I've applied all these things to myself and Paul's for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what's written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Uh, and this is the relationship between cultivating things or reputation or whatever, really anything. Um, but in our discussion, I think it applies to our, our pocketbooks and to have this understanding that everything we have is, is given unto us from the Lord. Therefore, chapter 1, verse 31, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So what do you have that you did not receive? Money and ministry. Okay, that's a, that's a thing. Uh, yeah, some of these things that are helpful in the discussion are, you, you got to pull it from a little bit of context. Is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it turns out the grain. That is an interesting use of the Old Testament right there to make the point that Paul's about to make. Um, is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake. Because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If 
If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Paul is saying that those who labor to preach and teach the gospel have a right to benefit materially from their labors. This is a much shorter version and summary of what he just taught there. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. It's more on the other side, right? It's more of a command. Uh, he's more teaching based on that law that those who sow material things and ought to reap material things. Did I say that right? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so spiritual things reaps. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Manuscript, please. <laughs> <laughs> James chapter two. This is interesting. And I think this this is this is in general, but I was sort of thinking about this in terms of ministry, actually. Um, and I mean we all we all have a ministry. Equip the saints for the work of ministry. Um, and so this is a command to likely, you know, the Jerusalem church that have been scattered. And uh, he says, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man is shabby and shabby clothing also comes in, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? The reason I'm pulling this out is because of the, the gold ring and the rich, the riches. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And I sort of thought, man, I don't know if I've ever been in a church where there is a single individual who sits on the board of elders who doesn't make over a hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, man, why? And I, I think there's, there's, this is a complex issue because elders are called in first Timothy three to be men who are able to manage their household in First Timothy. It even says that like the man who's not able to provide for his household is like worse than the devil himself. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And so like, I think that's that principle applies when like you're you're you know how is he doing, right? Just in general. And you know, if he's hanging out with Laz there, like begging at you know the rich man's table. That may have something to say, may not, about his ability to provide for his family. Uh, but I, I do think that there's probably a lot of undue partiality that goes on. Um, you know, uh, if I get these people at the very poor, our church is likely to do better over the over the long term. Uh, I think that's dangerous, and. Um, yeah, I think we need to examine our hearts, you know, the way, and I'm, I'm always coming back to this, you know, like young adults, but I think this applies to our interactions at young adults or in church on Sundays. Like, do you have those ministry glasses on? And are you looking for that person who may have nothing to bring to your relational table? You can't advance your status in the ministry or the group or your social capital, but needs 
that needs love. And, you know, I think that's one of the biggest weaknesses of our church, probably. It's just lather, rinse, repeat. Every week is the same. You show up and you flock to your little group. Uh, the people you're comfortable interacting with, the people that you glean energy, you know, social energy from, rather than, I just heard this sermon, Ephesians 4 teaches that it's these sermons and preachers and leaders and teachers that equip me for the work of ministry or service is that what I'm doing or is this my version of a country club oh boy Money and the prosperity gospel. gospel. Oh, this gonna be good. <laughs> the rest of it was rubbish, but that, that was, that was, that was really good. Okay. Now we're getting to the good part. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to show you guys a fun video of John Piper. Let's do it. Oh, I need to turn, I need to turn this on. No, I don't, because this is going to play it. I'm not used to the owl. Look at that thing. That's scary. Daniel, well, I was looking at you, bro. See that thing? Look at this creepy little Yoda man. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Why I abominate the prosperity gospel. That's quite a video title. Here we go. You guys see this? The online folks. Yeesh. We can see it. So why do I feel so? How do we uh? Get it we can hear it. We can hear it. We're good. You guys can't hear it. Yeah. Here, I think this will solve it. We'll just take away the sound from them. I don't think it will. Watch this. Watch this. Strongly about. <laughs> okay. Why are you just playing on the owl? I I don't think I can. We heard it before. Because my computer output's not going to the owl. Called prosperity gospel. Uh, there's an easy answer, but before I give it, um, let me define it a little bit. Um, it's it's on a continuum from the most radical to what would be called soft or light, and uh, the most radical would be basically say, God wants you rich, and you should partner with Him by faith to pursue riches and the justification would be given can't accomplish much in life without money and so go for it or another rationale might be your kingdom kids and kingdom kids don't wear tattered clothes they dress like the king and so on the light would be simply being more cautious not to say those gross things about wealth but to minimize sin and minimize pain and only talk about how well things will go for you if you follow Christ. So why, why do I abominate this 
so-called gospel. I think it is another gospel. And uh, the first reason would be simply to go straight to the Bible and see what Paul says about those who want to be rich. I mean, it's just, he says, this is 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, now there's great gain in godliness with contentment, in other words, without craving for stuff. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. If we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. <laughs> it's just amazing. But those who desire to be rich, now here's the key text, this is verse 9, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, that is, this craving to be rich, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. In other words, the, the very thing that leads people to suicidal piercings of pangs, namely the desire to be rich, is nurtured and cultivated by the prosperity preachers. They are encouraging that this suicidal behavior happen. That's abominable. Or Jesus, Jesus said, uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why would he say that? It's because riches are such dangerous things. They're not a blessing usually. They're usually a curse. People are cursed with riches. They're destroyed by riches. And here again, a little parenthesis of qualification. I don't mean it's sinful to make a lot of money. I just mean it's sinful to want to keep a lot of money. And it's suicidal to want to keep a lot of money. Bigger barns and bigger cars and bigger houses and bigger portfolios and finer clothes and everything is growing with your income so that your, your conscience is getting harder and harder because if you're a Christian at this point, your conscience is having to say, it's okay, it's okay. This is, this is okay. This is the Calvary road. This is what it means to deny yourself. This is what it means to follow Jesus. This is what it means to die every day. This is what it means to have my treasure in heaven. And it doesn't. It won't work. So your conscience has to be lacerated in order to keep from killing yourself. And so Jesus says, it's hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. Paul says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and pierce themselves with many pangs. And along comes a prosperity preacher who says, yes, the Lord really wants you to be rich. We should pursue riches. Following Jesus is the pathway to riches. Riches are the sign of God's blessing. I would just say those are in mutual contradiction for each other, and therefore this is deadly. Now, here's another reason I'm, I'm really upset about this. These prosperity preachers, preachers don't just talk to Americans who are already fairly well off and try to help them, you know, become a little more rich. They get on their jets, their personal jets, and they fly to Africa or the Philippines. And they land and they gather a stadium full of 100,000 desperately poor people and tell them if they'll believe in Jesus, they'll get rich and all their needs will be met and their wives don't have miscarriages anymore, blah, blah, blah. Then they get in their jet with their pockets full and go home. That's wicked. Because the Bible is so filled with teachings that in this life, this is a momentary affliction here. This light momentary affliction is working for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. What's Paul referring to there? He's referring to a lifetime. Light and momentary corresponds to the weight of eternal glory in heaven. He means when you come to Christ, you come and die, and you can count on it through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of heaven. Normal Christianity is pain. Sorrowful yet always rejoicing is the pattern. Prosperity preachers 
do not prepare new converts in third world countries to endure the realities of what it will cost them to be a Christian. Here's another reason. There are 1,568 or so, as we talk, people groups in the world out of 13,000 that don't even have missionaries engaging them, and therefore everybody in them is without hope. Most of those 1,500 people groups are in very dangerous places, meaning if you go there, your kids might either get disease and die, or uh, your wife might be captured and raped, or your family might be butchered and killed. Who's going to go? We have to go. Jesus said, make disciples of every people group, not just the easy ones, not just the comfortable ones. Who's going to go? The product of prosperity preachers? I don't think so. The people that are going to go are the people that have been taught that to, to follow Christ is to suffer, and it's brief. It's only 80 years. And then comes heaven. I just read this morning with Noel and Talitha, uh, first paragraphs of uh, Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the new Jerusalem coming down like a bride prepared for her husband. And he will dwell with us, and we will be his people, and he will be our God. And then every tear will be wiped away, and every uh, pain will be gone. For the former things, the former things have passed away. That's common. The, the, the essential biblical problem, maybe that's an overstatement, one of the essential biblical problems with the prosperity gospel is an over-realized eschatology. Meaning, the things that are promised gloriously for us, we're all going to be rich. We're going to own the world. We're going to judge angels. Paul used that argument in 1 Corinthians 3. Don't you realize that you are going to inherit the world? The world is yours. Paulus is yours. Cephas is yours. Life is yours. Death is yours. And the conclusion he, he drew was, why would you boast in men? In other words, why wouldn't you take that as a means of enabling you to suffer and be lowly and kind and, and servant-like and walk on this Calvary road and take the pain of being a Christian? That's coming. But what they do, instead of say, uh, we have to wait for that and, and pour our lives out through many tribulations here, they say, bring it now. Bring it now. The kingdom's already here, right? J Jesus brought the kingdom. And it's the overlap of these two ages they don't understand. The, the, the new age is a beautiful age. And there are healings that happen in this world. I don't deny that. I just deny very vehemently everybody's going to be healed. You let these prosperity preachers with their healing talk and their word of faith talk go to the fourth floor of Augustana home or go to the emergency rooms or to the uh, intensive care rooms of hospitals. Go there. Go there and preach your gospel. No, they don't. They wear their nice clothes, stand up with the lights, money strewn all over the the thing with people out here who desperately want somebody to tell them how to get rich, and there they make a lot of money that way. They don't go to the places where it's impossible to deal with reality unless you've got a theology of suffering. And so for all those reasons and more, it's a tragic thing that one of our greatest exports of America is the prosperity gospel. People are being destroyed by it. Christians are being weakened by it. God is being dishonored by it, and souls are perishing because of it. And a lot of guys are getting rich on it. Reactions, Piper? That helped me present. <laughs> really helpful. That last part is so helpful. <laughs> Only a theology of suffering would lead you to a place where it's happening. Mm -hmm. So good. 
other thoughts? There's a lot. I feel like we could watch that full time. Yeah. Uh, I'd have to go back, not in the full time yet, but I would like to personally suffer as a believer and learn this kind of way to where we'll be in the afterlife, and judging the things with the contracts right now. Yeah, I'd have to go back to it. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed the help of watching him just cite verbatim Paul and Jesus, and then to summarize the main teachings of the prosperity gospel, and just to say it's, it's another gospel. And the worst thing about it is they're shipping it in droves to the far reaches of the globe. I mean, this is true. Like, I'm just one pastor in one place. And I went to Tanzania with TLI, Training Leaders International. It's an organization that uh, takes people from the West who have theological education, and they go and they teach courses on how to preach the Bible expositionally throughout the world. And I went there, and the main practice, I, I taught a course on Ruth and uh, Jonah, how to preach them expositionally with 25 pastors from Tanzania. The main practice of two-thirds of them was to tune on Osteen and was spew the sermon they heard on the radio the next morning. It's true. Okay, we did the OT. I'll admit it was an easier assignment. But can we come up with a summary statement on the New Testament's theology of money? You guys got this. We're warm now. We're warmed up. I could summarize it by saying money is, or the love of money is dangerous. Yep, that's true. That's true. That's a metaphor. Maybe someone can take it to the same. So money is like a spear. So you can either use it mm -hmm. as a weapon to fight your wars, or you can lean on it. It'll go through your hands and pierce you. Mm. Interesting. I like that. I think um, the money um, and the material things that we've been blessed with isn't really ours. And so mm. being intentional in what we do with it and prayerful about what we do with it and how we handle it um, and what our heart is towards it is uh, I think I might say can't take it with you to heaven or hell. So give it away out of the heart love of Jesus. Something like that. Something like that? No cries of heresy coming from candy, so we should be in good shape. Uh, <laughs> questions? How are we doing? Questions on money? Katie, you said you had a question on money, didn't you? Last night you told me you had a question about money. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a money question, but maybe um, maybe we'll ask you afterwards if that's okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sure, that's, that's a question. Um, 
and it's more a semantic question, so it's probably already answered. But when people are thinking about giving to missions versus giving to the church, mm -hmm. is that still considered giving to the church? Is that considered something in addition? I'm not, yeah, I'm not like a missions guy, but um, I think there's probably a spectrum of thought with regards to how missions really should be done. And I think I would land where the church should be the engine that drives that ship. And I don't think that's really the case right now. Um, somehow it became like something the church outsourced to like these missions organizations. And like, I don't know, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily like the root of all evils or something. Uh, but I, I would say if you find a church that is demonstrably committed to reaching the ends of the earth with the good news of Jesus Christ, then you are serving both in giving to that church. Mm -hmm. But like Lindsay and I have given to individuals, you know, and you end up mailing money to some missions organization uh, that we met through church. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, we've done that sort of thing, but our typical practice is to give to the local church and entrust it to the elders, you know, who are responsible for demonstrating the carrying out of the mission of, of the, the church. Uh, at our church, it's a very mission oriented mission. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the last few words of it are <clears throat> and to the nations of the, and in the nations of the world, you know. So we're very committed to that. We have two full-time missionaries in training right now, uh, where we're equipping them to learn how to handle the word of God, so that they can go and multiply that elsewhere and. And we're not the only church that does that. Would one, so just in mind, would one arguably, like, if someone came to you and asked, like, will you support me financially as a missionary? Yeah. Would it arguably apply back to what we were talking about earlier? So can anyone ask me? No. Something from you? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, I do, I think that that's, a very broadly applicable teaching from Jesus. Um, I, yeah, there's opportunity cost. And so like Proverbs still is true, even though like Jesus says these things. So like there's wisdom, right? And I think there are some missionaries who are basically wasting every penny they're doing. And I'm not really into that. They're basically like taking the people of God's money and like buying groceries. And then they do it again the next year until they die. Um, that sucks. There's no demonstrable making of disciples at all. And so I would want you to, to say, here's what we're doing, and this is how we're making disciples. And then we can talk. You know, like I'm not, there's opportunity cost. You know? So that's something to think about. Part is like, I feel like missions is like the reason why so many of these missions organizations exist is because they feel like. The church isn't 
doing enough or not fulfilling our role and that's a great commission because even groups that you think of like the joshua project if that's not a church but they are you know a, a missions group that's helping and fulfilling them, that's a great commission so and like i feel like it's good to give to, to groups like that as well yeah. Yeah, I think the Joshua Project is a resource that's used by the church, kind of like TGC. Like if you were to give money to TGC, it's like, well, that's because I believe that that's a organization that's fueling the mission of the church. So it's almost like a, like a back door way to actually help the church carry out the Great Commission. Because as we train up missionaries, one thing we can do is look there and say, hey, what do you think about this place? And then we can start to, because we learn things through the Joshua Project that we wouldn't know otherwise, right? Um, does that make sense? But yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, there's another example of this with like next level, it's like, Parachurch ministries get born because there's a seen deficiency from that organization in something that church, they think the church should be doing. And then it's like born. Um, and so I think you're right. Like, you know, Lyle saw a deficiency in discipleship amongst men in the church and started this organization to start trying to help with that issue. And maybe there are these organizations like, uh, Send International or something like I don't know a ton about them or anything. Um, maybe they saw some kind of deficiency in the church in sending people. I think you know this is one of the things I try to get young adults to think about. It's why we sponsor people to go to to cross conference and stuff. Because like I think the baseline assumption every but every Christian is like I'm not a goer. Right? That's, that's somebody else's burden. Why is that the main assumption? Why is there not, why aren't a hundred people signed up for us to pay for them to go to cross conference? They don't understand the gravity of the situation. Or they do and they don't care. Yes, Katie, or Willem. Hello. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's more like, less a question and just more thinking out loud. But um, yeah, I was wondering to myself just now how our conceptions of money would change if we kind of get away from an Americanized, I guess, Western lens that we view the biblical teaching through. So like I feel like we have this conception of the teaching of money in light of like capitalism versus uh, socialism kind of deal. But like I wonder how our conception would completely change if we kind of got away from all that. I guess yeah, viewing uh, taking at face value what the Bible says about money. Can you give an example? <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess, well, like I mentioned, um, I feel like we get really hung up as Christians on like, we feel the need to defend capitalism super strongly, especially in the Western church. Um, and I've seen articles, like Christian articles on it and pulling stuff out to defend a theory like a man-made theory but i don't know i just we don't see anything like that in scripture and there's i feel like there's principles you can glean from both theories um so yeah that could be an example any follow-up to that 
I could follow up to my own follow up, but <laughs> no, yeah. Oh wait. Oh, <laughs> Never mind. People go first. <laughs> So I would say that, um, so, so uh, both uh, on the spectrum of capitalism, socialism, communism, whatever, um, all man-made um, quote unquote theories of economics, but, um, but all have uh, reflections in scripture. So, so like the entirety of, of scriptural passages that, that speak on money or like, like generosity, we talked a lot about generosity today, right? Generosity is predicated upon personal ownership, right? That's that's what generosity is, right? Like I can't be generous with money I don't have or something I don't own, right? Mm -hmm. um, so so the premise of generosity is predicated upon personal ownership. So mm -hmm. that kind of throws communism out the window. Because communism doesn't allow for personal ownership, <laughs> so so not saying that capitalism is the gospel in and you know I expect the imagination, but and, and it can certainly be distorted and used sinfully, and it has and it is. Um, but I would say that historically we see far far more. Um, godlessness and far, far more collective harm done through uh, Marxist-Leninist um, theories of economics and and social structure, which is what socialism and communism are. Yeah, I think that's a true principle. Like, I mean, it was the Levites, right? Who like, weren't allowed to own property, but all the other 11 tribes owned land and were responsible for the flourishing of the Levites, right? Um, I mean, Paul, <laughs> there's there's paradoxes when it comes to this sort of thing. Paul does say, what have you that you've not received? So he doesn't want us to think primarily that this is mine. He wants us to say, this is God's that has been entrusted to me, right? you know. But I think capitalism, to maybe Willem's point, is a system that sort of elevates me and mine and my achievements and my pursuits, and so it could it could be it could be sort of pushing that sort of yeah yeah. Like I, I would say, certainly capitalism. Uh, capitalism is a system in which greed can thrive, but communism and socialism are systems in which selfishness thrives. Absolutely, mm -hmm. right? The whole like the whole premise of socialist structures or communist structures are like I'm owed this, so you shouldn't have that, right? Mm -hmm. It's a it's a zero sum game uh, philosophy, which isn't biblical either, right? Just because someone is um, just because someone flourishes or someone succeeds doesn't mean someone else is um, is disadvantaged, right? Because we don't live in a closed system. God blesses those who He blesses, right? That's good. Is that helpful, Wilhelm? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was good. Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Um, uh, Duncan, what you started off saying, I mean, all of what you said was interesting, but um, yeah, you said you can glean principles from both, which I think is really true. Um, there's no evidence that like personal ownership is frowned upon in the New Testament, but um, it's interesting. We also see in Acts passages where it says believer, the believers like shared everything in common or they had everything in common. And so just that there is that spirit of sharing and giving and I guess like idealistic equality, uh, making sure all needs are taken care of, um, elements of which are can be found, I guess, in socialism, but 
there's also personal ownership and yeah i just feel like getting back to a simple biblical ethic of money is pretty refreshing yeah that acts two passage is interesting eh? and uh I think in Israel, it's sort of like every X amount of years, they would basically just dump everything into a giant pile and just distribute it evenly, right? It's kind of interesting. Um, but obviously, that was the exception. Yeah, and I would say too, like again, coming back to like what I said earlier, like that was volitional, right? Like, like, and, and again, like, like generosity, um, it's not supposed to be, I mean, we, we look at passages where it says it's not, it should be under compulsion, right? Like, like that's what state-driven communism is. That's mm -hmm. what state-driven socialism is. It's like, like mm -hmm. do your fair share, I'm gonna tell you what your fair share is, right? Yeah, and, and Willem, I think in Acts 2, there's even a little uh, aside in there. It says, as any had need. So I think there was a felt need where the resources were pooled. You know, it wasn't like this is this is the uh, government regulated yeah. sort of practice. Yeah, yeah. And you know, but the Christians were like, as any had need, the only way we're going to fill these needs in the church here is if we yeah. share everything. Yeah. And actually, I mean, we could say that you know, I think that'd be a wonderful thing for the men to to be known for. You know, they they're a hosp hospitality church. I don't think we are right now. I mean, I've been a part of churches that are more, uh, where it's like, hey, we got a pot of soup on. Come on over, bring your other new people and bring these people in. Yeah. That's pretty neat. And I think part of the reason for that is just the, the fact we're a regional church. And, you know, I've, I've been at churches where you can kind of walk home from there. It's much easier. Um, but I, yeah, I think we could grow in our, you know, they like have everything in common. You know, they share their soup after church. That would be that soup sharing church. I will say, I think there are some efforts being made to move in that direction. The soup sharing direction? I don't know about specifically that, but like to be a hospitality church. Yeah, that's good. All right. Uh, does being rich disqualify you from heaven? Absolutely not. Next question, please. <laughs> I think it's, it is worth honoring. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, the whole eye of the needle debacle. Uh, but something to think about. Next question, though. Here you go, Joe. I was kidding. <laughs> what dangers to the church does money present? Misuse of it for selfish gain. Okay, misuse for selfish gain. Excellent. I think just misuse, period, really. <laughs> this period, yep. Division. Can you spell that out a little more? Yeah, like in um, 1 Corinthians 11, where it shows the Lord's Supper. It's like some of you are mm. coming to get drunk, and then others are hungry to get there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and even churches that are based on like socioeconomic categories, almost like suburb church and the uh, the poor neighborhood city church and you know that that happens right it's a misplaced priority and uh, misplaced realization of the people in front of you when they don't yeah line up with that mm. certain economic status that a church may have labeled for itself Dangers, the dangers. Dangers What benefits does the church, does money offer? Mm -hmm. 
chapter? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gotten mine yet. <laughs> right now. What's that? We're at the wrong. Are you are you taking up a collection? <laughs> I wasn't planning on it, but I hadn't I hadn't considered it. <laughs> if you want if you want to if you want some uh, if you want to hear about some benefits to the church that that money would have, then uh, maybe. Adam, maybe you should ask Vilmar. I'm sure he could list off a whole bunch. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It allows us to buy stuff. Like books. Yes. Yeah. Those are actually mostly given to us, but oh, oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, somebody just ships us with stacks on stacks on stacks. All right. Uh, what other benefits? Being able to serve. Yeah. yeah, supporting missionaries who are actually doing it. Allows, you know, allows yeah. churches like like the, like the Met to have something like the internship program or the missionary and training program, you know, enables enables churches to do things like that, to equip kind of more up and coming uh people future church leaders and, and future you know missionaries yeah absolutely andrew's probably glad for the money that the next is <laughs> there are some benefits <laughs> all right what power does money have over our affections and desires Yeah, kind of talked about like where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So we have that food. And that's just to like Yeah, that's right. Uh, it allows us to pursue our affections and desires to a greater extent. So I think mm. that's why it matters like what our desires are and where our affections are. Because mm -hmm. if they're for God and for the kingdom, then we can pursue that in a, in a new way. Mm -hmm. It opens up doors, but if it's from something else, then it, it can lead in another direction as well. Mm -hmm. oh, I think we're around yeah. six. I will. Oh, I oh. think... Um, um, what was just said was really good because it, um, it was along the lines of um, something that I heard from Tim Keller one time. He basically talked about primary and secondary idols, how primary idols are the things we desire most, things that we don't, we're not necessarily aware of on the surface, like comfort and security um, and admiration. And secondary idols are the things we use to get to our primary idols. And so I think most of the time money isn't a primary idol, but it is a secondary idol. I think most often it's like comfort and security, at least for me, is my primary idol and I use money to get to it. So. That's really, that's really helpful. Yeah, most things this. I would say, you know, and this is this is coming from this is coming from from a guy who's a musician, and being a musician, that's that's an expensive expensive career path. Just gonna put it out there. So, like, yeah, I like I like that. You know, I like what Willem just said in that regard. Like for me, I think money would be more of a secondary idol for me. You know, it's more of a means to an end sort of idol it's like i want i want money so i can buy this gear 
you know, there's music here, you know. <laughs> yeah, I really like what you said too, because sometimes there's things that Lindsay and I would like really like to do for someone, you know, and it's like, uh, just, I just don't know if we can do that, you know. We like save it for our kids to like go to school. And it's just like there's all these things, um, and I, it would be it would be really nice to be like, yeah, I can I I can do that, um, for it to be able almost to come from that place and then to be able to execute it. So I feel like sometimes we have the desire, and then the funds aren't really there, and that's. A sadness almost um, sometimes. All right, this is the last one. We got two minutes. Look at that. What needs to change most drastically about the church's approach to money? I'm going to say, I don't know if it's what needs to change most, but I think something that I've learned definitely from today is maybe the way even just the church in general talks about and um, I guess like the relationship with tithing, because I feel like truly like I have no idea like what I, like I feel like I have an understanding like of, of now a better understanding of like how to cheerfully give and like being intentional about it and everything, but like I truly feel like I grew up with like all these concepts and I'm like, were these really like founded? I don't know, my whole like thing is just shaken up. But I'm just like, I didn't yeah, mean to question your parents. Your I know, I'm just like, I'm this side of bullshit. I'm trying to go back and question everything. But like, um, I think the way like the church just talks about tithing and teaches about tithing and, and giving in general and like what it all means, I think needs to change. Yeah, Daniel. I would say re recognizing the gift that money is to us, that God has given to us, and each of our own individual circumstances. And really, I, I'd say being more aware and responsible. I know that's very general and broad and not enough to elaborate, but I really think to uh, use that money in integrity. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we've kind of lost our sense of what yeah, really is. And we've become, it's easy to, with money to become so internally obsessed or just enclosing your own circle. You're kind of blind to what it can actually do uh, for others. And also with those who are in power or entrusted with more, obviously, it's a great uh, burden, burden with them. Last chance. Thank you all so much for your meaningful participation. So helpful. We can. Uh...